Good morning, welcome to our St Lawrence's online sermon for Sunday the 7th of June. My name's Steve, I'm the vicar here at St Lawrence's. So let, you te- let me tell you about my dad. Here he is. This is my dad. Lots of people know him as Pete or Peter. Obviously for me and my sister, he's simply dad. The girls know him not as granddad or grandpa or gramps, but as Grand Pete. You pronounce it with a sort of faux French accent or Grand Pete. I don't know why you do. My dad isn't massively bilingual or in any way, as far as I'm aware, got any French ancestry. But it's very my dad, if you know what I mean, to come up with his own title rather than do what everyone else is doing. So my dad is genetically a mix of genetic characteristics from his parents, my grandpa Frank and my gran Peggy, or Barmy Gran, as again, interestingly, she self-titled herself. Can you see what's going on there? You can't fight genetics, can you? Barmy Gran leads to Grand Pete. But let me tell you about my dad from a chemical perspective. As you see, My dad is 60% water, 60% protein, 60% fat, 6% minerals and 1% carbohydrates. To give you an even more precise understanding of my dad, he's 65% oxygen, 18% carbon, 9.5% hydrogen, 3.2% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1.2% phosphorus, 0.4% potassium, 0.2% sulfur, 0.2% sodium, 0.2% chlorine, 0.1% magnesium, and that will last one little percent. Apparently it's made up of lots of other things like gold and iron, which I can only assume is my dad's fillings. What we learn from this is that despite my dad's very high water content, it would appear that he is highly flammable. And if he was a snack bar for lions, then the traffic light barcode on the front of his wrapper would say that because of his high protein content and low sugar levels, he would be entirely suitable for any lions who were following the Atkins diet. I think I should also point out that I think his 0.2% sulphur content can fluctuate. Sometimes, like the rest of us, when he has baked beans, I suspect there might be the odd sulphur leak, which may lower that percentage a little. But of course, my dad is so much more than his genetic or chemical composition. My dad is a dad. He's Grand Pete. He's a son, a brother, a father-in-law, an uncle. He's a former civil service manager, a former GP practice manager, a former probation office manager. Can you see a pattern here? I can only assume that he liked wearing suits and organising people. Although to be fair to him, he would probably come back at me. It's a bit rich coming from you, son. For part of your job, sometimes you wear a dress. He's now currently retired, a man of leisure. Although on the side, he's also a volunteer classroom helper in a local school, a respite foster parent. He's a volunteer debt advisor. And then in the domestic domain, he's a gardener and a painter and a washer upper and a retro caravan aficionado. He's a long suffering twitcher accomplice. And of course, husband to my mum, Viv, and a committed Christian and follower of Jesus. But there's more. There's my dad's character. When my mum and dad were going through the lengthy process of being checked out by Bernardo's to check they were suitable to be respite foster parents, my sister Heather and I had to do a kind of parenting character reference thing, a form basically. Let me tell you, that's a weird experience. Commenting on your parents' parenting skills and general character all feels a bit odd, especially when you're now a parent yourself. Just for a moment, imagine doing that yourself. What would you write on the form? From my experience, it brings out a weird mix of emotional thankfulness and funniness as you think of those moments where you drove your parents to the very edge of sanity and reason. What was really weird was that without any cheating, without any collaboration at all, we did it properly, we didn't speak to one another, with the whole world as our oyster to comment upon our parents, 
both my sister and I used exactly the same image to communicate the character of our dad. This is who we both randomly came up with. It's Bumpy Dog from the Noddy stories. When my sister and I were growing up, we, used, we read those old Eni Blyton books, but on the, on the right there is, is possibly how those of a younger generation will, will know Noddy and Bumpy Dog. Bouncy, full of energy and enthusiasm affectionate and definitely needs at least one good a walk a day. That's our dad in a nutshell. He's engaging, chatty, warm, friendly, a real people person. Well, why am I telling you this? Is it me getting ahead of things for Father's Day in a couple of weeks? Well, probably the sulphur remark and possibly the comparison to Bumpy Dog have probably got me more negative points than positive ones. But it's this. However much I tried to describe my dad to you, explain him to you, to communicate his character and his personality and his appearance and his qualities and his take on life, I can never do him justice. He's my dad. I'd be lost without him. I massively respect him and value him. But however much I might try and communicate him with words and facts and descriptions and anecdotes from his activity and life, they're just not going to be enough, not even his chemical composition. The only way you're going to get to know my dad properly is to meet him. And not just to meet him, but to get to know him. Today is Trinity Sunday, the annual Sunday in the church year where preachers and vicars like myself take on the task of trying to communicate the nature of God. Yeah, that's little old me. A mere, finite, mortal human being trying to comprehend and to communicate and to capture God. God the creator, God the divine, the infinite, the eternal. It's madness really, but it's probably good sport for you to watch me sweat and squirm once a year. I can't even do full justice to trying to communicate my dad, a fellow mortal, fragile human being. So how am I going to communicate God in 10 or 12 minutes? Well, maybe this will help. OK, so maybe Latin isn't making it any easier. What about in English? As Christians, we believe in one God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Three distinct divine eternal persons, but one God. So there you have it. What do you make of that diagram? OK, so I'll admit that it leaves me a bit cold. Yes, this diagram, this picture, this image is factually correct, but I'm not really clicking with this inanimate triangle of divine plumbing, as it looks like to me. Is it factually correct? Yes. Is it theologically correct? Yes. But it's a bit like me describing the chemical composition of my dad. It's not really communicating him, his personality and character. So what about this clip art that I found online? What do you reckon? Well, it's definitely capturing more of that distinctive person, so Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But what do you reckon? I'm not sure the father would be all that happy with the whole mystical Kenny Rogers, Santa Claus on holiday thing. Maybe Jesus might be OK with his clip art image. But what about God, the Holy Spirit? If I was to pick a person of the Trinity that I think has been most maligned and misrepresented within the church, it would have to be God the Holy Spirit. I guess quite a lot of you who are of a, how shall I put this diplomatically, a finer vintage will remember God the Holy Spirit being barely spoken of in church. And when he was spoken of, the Holy Spirit was called the Holy Ghost. And you can't help it, can you? Just the mention of the word ghost makes you, th you think of someone in a bedsheet, a ghost in a haunted house. Woo! The Holy Ghost, which I hope you know is not doing the Holy Spirit any justice at all. As far as I can see it, this clip art has one single, very small, positive. It does at least mean you avoid this other misspeaking. Speaking of God the Holy Spirit as a thing, as an it. 
you remember cousin it from the Adams family, right? No person, let alone the third person of the Trinity, should be called it. Just to explain, the whole Holy Ghost thing comes from the language used in the King James Version of the Bible, as they translated the ancient Hebrew and Greek into the English of the day. They use the most appropriate word. For us today, ghost means a man with a bedsheet over his head. I guess the sort of the idea of a disembodied soul floating around. But at the time of the King James translation, the word ghost simply meant what we understand as spirit today, an immaterial being. Anyway, getting back on track. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, each fully God and yet distinctive persons. Let me throw some big words at you. The Bible testifies from Genesis to Revelation that there is one God, but three co-eternal, consubstantial persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God in three divine persons, three persons that are distinct, yet of one divine, eternal substance, essence or nature. Or let me put it another way. God is perfect. It's perfect relationship, perfect unity. As 1 John 4 verse 8 puts it, simply, God is love. Let me read to you our Bible reading for our service today. It's from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In our Bible reading, we hear Jesus giving his final instructions to the disciples before he ascends to heaven. The disciples' great commission, their life's mission, and the mission that we too, as his, as his disciples today inherit, is to make disciples, to share what we have, to share what we found, to share our faith with others and to baptise them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But what have we found? What do we have to share? What is our faith? What do we have to share as Christians? Well, heckle me if you disagree, but it's not a set of doctrinal statements. It's not just a set of rules to live by. It's not just a worldview or a way of looking at life. What have we found? What we have to share is the relationship with the living God. Yes, we have found all those other things, but really the life-changing treasure we have found is a personal relationship with God. We believe in one God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A relationship of perfect unity and purpose. A relationship of perfect love and interrelatedness. And it's into that relationship that we are invited. To go back to our commission, we are commissioned by Jesus to baptise new disciples in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. When I was born, I was blessed to be born into relationship with my parents. I say blessed because I know that that isn't always the case for every child. Sometimes tragically the dad isn't around or sometimes tragically they lose their mother in childbirth. But I was blessed to be born into a relationship with my bouncy, sulphur emitting bumpy dog dad. In baptism we are reborn into a restored relationship with God. Where in verse 19 of our Bible reading it says we should baptise new disciples in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The word translated in here is in the original Greek. It sort of more has a sense of into the name. I was physically born into the family of Dyson, into the name of my father, into the privileged relationship of being his son. When we were baptised in the name of, into the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we are born, spiritually reborn, into the name, into the family, into the relationship of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. 
I personally like the Celtic take on capturing the relationships of the Trinity in a sort of image. You have three distinct persons, but like a visual illusion, they're three distinct persons and yet totally interconnected. And the ring symbolises that unity of the divine. They are one God. And here's the amazing thing. We are invited into this perfect relationship, into this love. We are invited to live in the middle. We were made to live in relationship with God. But the fall led to us being born outside of that relationship. God is holy. God is perfect love. We aren't. So as it sometimes says on our computers, there's a compatibility issue. God is holy. God is perfect love. And we are not. I wonder if you've ever had this on your computer screen or something similar, I guess, is like putting unleaded in your diesel car or confusing the sugar with the salt when you're cooking. God is holy. God is perfect. And we on our own aren't compatible with a perfect holy God. Jesus came to fix that compatibility issue. He who is perfect took upon himself our sin and imperfection so that because of him and through him, we could be holy. God is perfect. God is holy. And we on our own aren't compatible with a holy God. We're on the outside. We're separated. But because of Jesus, because he takes away our sin, all our mistakes, our regrets, our shame, as God sees us, we are as pure and as unspoilt as the whitest snow. That means that as Colossians 3 puts it, we are hidden in Christ. That means that we are invited into relationship with God. We're no longer on the outside separated, but we're on the inside. We're in. We're in right relationship with God. And it doesn't just stop there. As the risen Jesus promised his disciples when he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. God the Holy Spirit came in his place, a helper like him. So actually we aren't just baptised into that perfect relationship of God. But through the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, that relationship comes into us. Now I've been focusing a bit on getting fit during lockdown. I guess quite a few of us maybe have done. I just want to say that clergy shirts can be a bit disguising. So here I am. It's a bit embarrassing, but it's the only sort of recent photo that I've got to share with you. When we give our lives to Jesus, we are restored into that relationship. That relationship also enters us. When we receive God's forgiveness and new life, we become the abode, the temple of God, the Holy Spirit. God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. God is one God, three persons. God is love. God is perfect relationship. Through the self-giving love of God demonstrated most fully in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, we are invited into perfect relationship with God. And that perfect relationship comes into us and we are changed. Changed to help others to too enter into that relationship. To go back to my dad, if I want someone to be in relationship with him, I introduce them to him. Yes, I tell them about him. Yes, I might tell them how great he is. But the clincher is I introduce them to him. Relationship is so, so, so important to the Christian faith. God is relationship. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we're called to introduce others to God and that personal relationship. That's our primary mission. During COVID-19, we've experienced how uncomfortable it is for us to be separated from others. I want us to remember that discomfort and for it to remind us how even more uncomfortable and tragic it is for our friends and family and neighbours and work colleagues to be separated from God, to be outside of relationship with him. As we watch the tragic events on the news, we know that we live in a broken world. Conflict, fear, oppression, distrust, poverty. 
I want us to remember that the answer to all our brokenness as the human race is the restored relationship with God. It's Trinity Sunday. We worship a relational God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 reminds us, perfect love casts out fear. Amen. Amen.